Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome live to the Little Lindbergh Interpretive Center here on the banks of the Mississippi in Little Falls, Minnesota. I'm here with Charlie Potler and Gabriel Meyer. And Gabriel's actually in the plane right now. We're here today to discuss Charles Lindbergh, and we have a great program for you. It should last about an hour. And many of you may know that Charles Lindbergh lived in Little Falls, Minnesota, but we want to find out why he was so famous and what he's so revered for. He became famous, of course, for flying across the Atlantic, first pilot to do so. And we are going to take a look at his life, and Charlie's going to host it a little bit, talk about what Lindbergh did. Gabriel's going to show us the cockpit of the airplane. And we're going to have some fun learning about Charles Lindbergh today. His plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, was what he took across the Atlantic. And back in 1927, it was probably the most technologically advanced plane at that time. At the end of this time, we're going to answer questions from you. We do have a telephone number that's going to pop up on the screen. That number is area code 320-616-5421. This program today is sponsored by Channel 6, Central Media, Minnesota Access. We're on live Channel 6 in Little Falls, Channel 10 in Piers, and Channel 98 in Charter Communications. We want to welcome you by starting out with a short videotape, pre-recorded, about Charles Lindbergh's boyhood right here in Little Falls, Minnesota. So, take it away. He was flying, stopped running during bad weather. Charles Lindbergh was born in 1902 to Evangeline and C.A. Lindbergh. His mother was a school teacher and taught him, taught high school chemistry in Little Falls and his father was a lawyer who had his law practice also in Little Falls. They had built a house along the banks of the Mississippi River, shown here. It was a large house called a bungalow and had two stories above ground and a full basement underneath the house. His mother, Evangeline, had this photo taken of herself and her son when he was eight months old. She was a proud mother, and in this picture, Charles is wearing what most infant boys wore back then, a long frock. As a child, young Charles played along the banks of the river and learned to love the outdoors. As he grew older, he hunted and fished along its banks, often with his dogs, and had a happy childhood on the farm near Little Falls. He is seen hunting with his father, C.A., near the river in this photograph. In 1917, Lindbergh was upstairs in his house when he heard this low rumbling noise coming from the river. This turned out to be an airplane flying low, the first one that Charles had ever seen. Seeing this airplane changed his life immediately and he decided right then and there he wanted to be an airplane pilot. Charles was interested in all things mechanical, especially engines that propelled tractors, automobiles, and motorcycles. At a very young age, he started working on engines, and by the time he was 15, could take one completely apart and put it back together again. He knew how they worked, what parts would break, and how to fix what, what parts did break. In 1918, when he was 16 years old, Charles purchased a motorcycle at Engstrom's Hardware Store in Little Falls. When not traveling, he was seen working on it and other engines at his home. In 1920, Charles left Little Falls to attend the University of Wisconsin, but a short time later, he had left college and headed to Lincoln, Nebraska, where he enrolled in flight school. This is where he would finally learn how to fly. After learning the basics of flight, Charles barnstormed through the country meaning he flew at air shows performing stunts, often with other pilots. The photo here shows a barnstorming stunt pilot who has climbed out of his plane to hang upside down on a rope. After a couple minutes, he would have climbed back up the rope and into the plane to continue flying. Sometimes barnstormers would have a pilot fly the plane for them while they perform the stunt. Lindbergh performed all kinds of similar stunts, with his favorite being wing walking, where he would walk on the wings while the plane was flying. By 1923, Charles Lindbergh wanted to buy his own plane. Since the First World War had ended just five years before, there was a surplus of extra planes available for purchase. Lindbergh drove his motorcycle to Americus, Georgia, where he bought this airplane, an old army biplane called a Jenny. As you can see, biplanes get their name from having two wings, one on top of the other. The total cost for this surplus machine was $500, and included the trade-in of his motorcycle. After barnstorming another year, Charles decided he needed more formal training and wanted to learn how to fly the most modern aircraft available, which could only be found in the Army. He joined the Army Air Service Reserve, where he trained in Texas. Training was very difficult, but Charles studied 
hard and learned everything there was to know about the planes he flew. This training and the experience he gained as a barnstormer would come in handy a few short years later. By 1924, he had graduated from the Army's flight school and was looking for work. Flying during this period was quite dangerous, and the U.S. Mail Service had started transporting the mail in airplanes to get letters and packages to their destinations quickly. By 1926, Charles was working for a commercial airplane company in St. Louis, Missouri, which was awarded a contract to fly mail from St. Louis, Missouri to Chicago, Illinois. In April 1926, Lindbergh was the first airmail pilot to fly between these two cities. Flying the mail could be extremely dangerous, and during this time Lindbergh had to bail out twice when the planes he was flying stopped running during bad weather. Using his parachute, he was able to land safely both times. It was during these mail flights that Lindbergh had this thought to describe his new dream. Why shouldn't I fly from New York to Paris? I'm almost 25. I have more than four years of aviation behind me and close to 2,000 hours in the air. I've barnstormed over half of the 48 states. I've flown my mail through the worst of nights. Why shouldn't a flight across the ocean prove as possible as all these things have been? As I attempted them, I will attempt that too. Well, we are standing live at the heart of the Interpretive Center. And the exhibits that you see behind me and to the side are relatively new and they depict the entire life of Charles Lindbergh. Many of Lindbergh's personal belongings are sitting right here at the Interpretive Center. And one of the features here is a mock-up model of the Spirit of St. Louis that you see behind me. And I'm going to talk to Charlie now. Charlie, first of all, a little background on you. How long have you been with the Center? I've been here uh, almost two years. Okay. So I came from another site within the Minnesota Historical Society system. And, uh, but I've always had an interest in aviation history and an interest in Lindbergh. When I was a small child, my parents gave me a copy of the Spirit of St. Louis. Wow, that's so. great. So here I am 30 years later. And as a site manager, this is a yeah. wonderful place to visit, I must say. Thanks. Uh, Charlie, a couple questions for you. I want you to answer these if you can. Mm -hmm. Why did Charles Lindbergh want to fly across the Atlantic at all? Well, it's, it's really a two-part answer to that question. Number one, he had an adventurous spirit. Uh, he did not ever really listen to anybody who told him that he couldn't do something. Uh, he was very mechanically inclined. He could take an engine apart. And he, he never listened to his father when he said, don't take that engine apart. He took apart the family tractor. He took apart other engines. And that's how he learned. So he really had no fear of death, of the unknown. And the second part of that answer is, is money. <laughs> there was, that's what motivates a lot of people. But um, Lindbergh knew that there was um, a cash prize of $25,000 waiting for the person who flew across nonstop the Atlantic from New York to Paris. In 1919, there was a Frenchman by the name of uh, Mr. Ortig, and he offered, right after World War I, $25,000 to any pilot that could do that. Now, that's flying from New York to Paris nonstop. So that was a lot of money back then. It's even a lot of money now. So Definitely. Well, we're standing in front of a mock-up of the model of the Spirit of St. Louis. Charlie, tell us about the Spirit of St. Louis. I'm going to step aside yeah. for a second while you take over. Well, to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, Lindbergh knew because of the previous attempts, once this prize was offered, uh, many men attempted it, and uh, they flew solo, they flew two at a time, none of them made it. Uh, they either died in the process or turned back. So he knew he needed a specialized plane for this. And that's where uh, he, I can take you through some of these, some of these areas. He needed to fly 3,600 miles. That's the New, New York to Paris distance. So uh, he needed a plane that could fly actually a little bit farther than that in case he got off course, then he could get back on and find his way. Um, he needed financial backers who could pay for the plane. Most pilots then, as well as now, are not wealthy people. Usually pilots, if they were an airmail pilot or if they had their own plane, they needed a financial backer to help pay for that. So he had to round up some people who could pay the $15,000, what he thought it was going to cost to do that. Here we see a photo of the Ryan Aircraft Factory coming up on the screen. And uh, the, Aaron, the Ryan Aircraft Factory was located in San Diego. And they were the company who actually manufactured the Spirit of St. Louis. Now, believe it or not, the Spirit of St. Louis was Lindbergh's second choice. Uh, there was a plane that was already manufactured, and it was in New York, and it cost $15,000. He went to New York to meet with the owners, 
but they took one look at this skinny 25-year-old kid, they thought, and they didn't think he had the experience or the know-how to make the trip, so they wanted to assign him a pilot. He would kind of be the secondary person, kind of the advisor. Of course, knowing Lindbergh's spirit, he didn't want to have anything to do with that. He had the experience through airmail and through the Army Air Corps Reserve and all of that. So he came back pretty discouraged, but he found out about this small fledgling company in San Diego called the Ryan Aircraft Company. He wired them, and uh, he wanted to know, can you build this plane to my specifications? They wired back, yes, we have an engineer. We can do that for $10,500. It's actually a lot less money than the previous plane. So he went out to San Diego and uh, had them build it. He worked with an engineer named Donald Hall, and together they pretty much built the plane specifically for Lindbergh and for that plane. They measured his legs, they measured his arms, they custom built the cockpit for him. Now behind you, I'm going to start off with some of the features of the Great. Spirit of St. Louis. This is a photograph, I don't know if you can get a close-up of that, of Charles Lindbergh with the specialized engine, and it's called a Wright Whirlwind engine. It's a J5C, and this was the state-of-the-art engine for aircraft in 1927. So you may recognize the last name, Wright, and that was uh, named after Orville and Wilbur Wright, who were the first people to ever fly at all. And remember, flight occurred in 1903 for the first time. So we're just, this is just a few years later, in 1927, that Lindbergh is attempting this feat. So the other thing, among many, that distinguished the spirit of St. Louis uh, from other airplanes was the prop, or propeller. And uh, this is just a model, but uh, it was made out of a metal alloy. And there are two metals or more that are chemically combined to form a harder metal. So this was flexible. It could withstand a lot of vibrations and a lot of wind. Now on this model, we've got a couple of the earlier props from Lindbergh's plane that we mentioned during the pre-tape segment. This is a model of a, of a Jenny, which was a surplus World War I plane. And you notice that it has a wooden prop. When you use a wooden prop with an airplane back then, you, you went through quite a few of them over time. Uh, that's why we have two of them on exhibit. Lindbergh would break the props and he would just give them to the area farmer where he happened to land. So he wanted one that could withstand a 4,000 mile flight, which was just unheard of back then. So. Now, I want to ask a question that the kids mm -hmm. are probably wondering about. Sure. If he's from Little Falls, Minnesota, why is the plane called the Spirit of St. Louis? That's a good question. <laughs> it would be nice to go to the Smithsonian today and look up at the Spirit of St. Louis where it's housed right now and see the spirit of Little Falls <laughs> on the fuselage. But that wasn't to be because Lindbergh got his financial backers from St. Louis. Uh, this is from when he ran the mail route from St. Louis, Missouri to Chicago, Illinois. That's where he made a lot of friends. He got to know a lot of uh, well-heeled people, uh, people that had money in St. Louis, because remember, they were sponsoring a lot of these pilots. So he got to know the community there in St. Louis, the aviation community, and they were the ones who paid for his plane. But it's interesting to know that once he won the prize, the $25,000, he made it a point to pay back his backers, even though they really didn't want it because everybody was famous, everybody was, got what they wanted, he still paid them back. Wow. We're here live with Charlie Potler, the site manager of the Lindbergh Interpretive Center here on the banks of the Mississippi in Little Falls. If you're just joining us, this is broadcast live on Channel 6 in Little Falls, sponsored by Channel 6. We're on Channel 10 in Piers, Channel 98 Charter Communications. We're talking with Charlie about the spirit of St. Louis. And Charlie, what made the spirit of St. Louis such a special plane? Well, many things. Uh, let's go to a photo of the spirit of St. Louis with Charles Lindbergh standing in front of it. That's the finished plane, and uh, there were many things that distinguished this, like I said, from other planes. Let's start with the wings. Uh, the wingspan, which the, vis the audience can't see, but we have it marked out on the carpet. It's 46 feet long for a wingspan, and that was extremely long for an airplane back then. Um, a cruising speed, an average cruising speed for the Spirit of St. Louis was 100 miles per hour. That was fairly fast for an airplane. Uh, it had it was called a monoplane, which means that it had one wing instead of a biplane, like you see on the Jenny here. This was a fairly common plane design in the 1920s. Well, Lindbergh wanted a monoplane. Also, it, he wanted a range of 4,000 miles, even though it takes 3,600 to get from New York to Paris. He wanted that extra 400 miles in case he was blown off course or had to go around something like an electrical storm, which he did actually have to during the, the trip. Uh, without fuel, the plane weighed 5,000 pounds. With fuel, you added another 2,700 pounds to the, to the plane weight. Um, 
wanted to talk a little bit about the fuselage. The area, the main section of a plane is called a fuselage. And that is where you have your gas tanks, your pilot in the cockpit or pilots, and then you have storage space behind the pilot. Lindbergh was really concerned about weight. The heavier you were, the more gas you had to use, the less chance you would have of getting across the ocean. So I think what we'll do is just talk briefly about the, the gas tank. He carried 251 gallons of fuel. That's kind of hard to visualize, but you know your milk in, in a grocery store comes in one gallon uh, jugs. Imagine 251 of those lined up. That's how much fuel it took to get Lindbergh across the Atlantic Ocean. So he had a tank up here. He had a tank right in front of the cockpit. This was his main tank right here, and it, it held 210 gallons of fuel. Now, because, actually, I grabbed the wrong model. Because he wanted that fuel tank right there, that made the plane fairly unbalanced. I'm going to show you a photo. You can get a close-up of the, the Jenny here. When Lindbergh was, bought his Jenny and when he was in flight school, you'll notice this is a typical plane from the period. It's got two openings, one for the pilot in front and one for the navigator in the back. Lindbergh noticed that when a plane had to crash land, usually on takeoff, or had to come back because of a mechanical problem, upon a hard impact to the earth, the, the fuel tank would go through the fuselage and crush the pilot to death. The person behind the fuel tank which was the navigator, usually survived the accident. So this was going through his mind when he went out to San Diego and had the Spirit of St. Louis designed. So on this model of the Spirit of St. Louis, his gas tank is right here and then a smaller one right here. But you notice that what's unique about this plane, because the gas tank is right there, he doesn't have what? He can't see in front of him. He has no windshield. So when we get into the cockpit, we'll talk about how he navigated around that issue. Fascinating, Charles Lindbergh doing this at age 25 back in 1927. What, yeah. what a time of his life. We're going to direct our attention right now to our simulated Lindbergh pilot in the cockpit of the mock-up of the uh, Ryan aircraft. And I'm over here, if you can see me. I'm with Gabriel Meyer. And there's Gabriel. Uh, looking a little bit like Lindbergh today. You're missing your cap and glasses, though. <laughs> Gabriel, we're going to take a look at some of the things in the cockpit itself. And uh, one of the things that all pilots have to deal with is how to get around. And Lindbergh, of course, like Charlie mentioned, he had no eyes. He didn't have a windshield. Uh, can you go through the instruments that are on his board? Because that's what he was doing to basically navigate this flight. He was doing this without looking out a windshield. Yeah. So how did he get around? Well, you know, basically, to start off, the instrument panel here is really simple compared to modern airplanes. But at the same time, it really does the same thing that modern airplanes do. When you talked about not having forward vision, one thing that he had, if you can see it here, is a periscope. One of the men who was working at the Ryan Aircraft was actually in the Navy, and he came up with this design so Charles could see out the front. And it is retractable so that it wasn't hanging off the side of the airplane because there would be a little bit of wind resistance there. And that was one thing that Charles was definitely concerned about. Um, let's see here. First of all, I, I don't know if you can get a vision of the back of the airplane. The, there's something called, it's kind of like a windmill. Right, I see it back here. We can get a shot of that. It's great. Yeah, right up here. Right there. there you go. Perfect. That, that was like a windmill. What it did is as it revolved, it actually made an electrical current that ran into the fuselage here, and it, um, it powered the earth inductor compass. The earth inductor compass, if you see right here at the, my right hand, is, um, it was like a standard compass, but it wasn't, it didn't, um, it wasn't affected by vibration and acceleration. The only thing that could really affect this was an electrical storm. There we go, right down there. Right Great. here. What Charles would do is he would set this at the, uh, where he wanted to go for the southwest, you know, whatever. And then up here on the instrument panel, you can see there's another part of the compass and that would tell him if he was going off course. So you're telling me that he did not see most of this flight. Right. Yep. Wow. He had two windows on either side, um, and then he also had the skylight here. They were made from an early form of plastic called celluloid. He actually took those off before he went across the Atlantic um, for whatever reason. He knew it would be cold up there, and the air coming in would keep him awake. I know we have a picture of the original 
uh, instrument panel that's in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in go. Washington, D.C. Right yep, that's the original panel in the spirit of St. Louis. I'll kind of direct you here and tell you what each one did. That sounds great. We're going to come up some close-up shots, I think, of some of these so you can actually see. Okay. There you go. Great. Up here on the top is a mirror, and that gave him some uh, vision of the back of his airplane to kind of see what was going on back there. You could see in the back of the fuselage. He also had a view of the uh, skylight here so you could see outside. Right below that is the earth inductor compass that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. To the right is the altimeter, and that told him how far he was off the ground. It showed him his altitude, some thousand feet. Over on the right is a graph that he actually made while he was in flight, and that just told him how much gas he had used, how much time he had flown, the RPMs of the engine, things like that. To the left of that is the clock. It was actually an eight-day clock. Once it was wound up, that would last eight days, and that told him what time it was. It took 33 and a half hours to go across the Atlantic. Next to that is the airspeed indicator. That told him how fast he was going. Like Charlie said earlier, he usually kept it around 100 miles per hour, but he could get it up to about 124. Then in the middle is the turn bank indicator, and that told him if his if the plane was level or if it was um, too much to the right or too much to the left. The tachometer, which tells him what the revolutions per minute were on his propeller and on the engine. This is a magneto switch, and what this did is it sent sparks to the spark plugs in the engine, which fired the pistons, which made the engine go. Um, down here is the oil pressure gauge to tell him how much oil was left, how much he had used. The fuel gauge, and then the oil temperature was right here. And the middle thing, um, actually it's kind of green, that was called an inc inclimiter, and that told him how much, uh, if the plane was going up or going down, which direction he was going. Now, this airplane is much the same as a lot of airplanes that are flown now, except for the fact that there's a windshield in most new planes. Mm -hmm. How did he steer the plane, and what did he have to do to make sure he got on course after he's using all his instruments? It's not that easy to do, as I understand. Right. He used a technique or a method called dead reckoning, and that actually, he would take a, a map and he would map out his coordinates. You know, if he was going from Little Falls to St. Cloud, he would know he needed to head south. And he um, would set his compass to the direction he needed to go, and then based on the amount or the speed he was going, he would know how long it should take to get from point A to point B. And that's what he called dead reckoning. Dead reckoning has nothing to do with death, does no. it? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Well, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the steering system in the plane? Because yeah. I know that most planes, pilots, use the rudders to steer a plane right. and a stick. Mm -hmm. Same thing with this plane? Yep. Here, the stick um, was between the pilot's legs, and this directed the airplane. Um, down here on the floor, I don't know if you've got a view of it, is you've got a good uh, shot. how he would there you go. move the rudders back and forth. These in front of me are called petcocks. And what they did is they turned the fuel on or off using different tanks. One thing that Charles made sure when he was flying is that his airplane was level or stable, and so he would take and use a certain amount of fuel from one end or tank, and then he would use it from the other tank so that he made sure he wasn't off level. That is just amazing, doing this without knowing where you're going, really. Yeah, it just is. Amazing. It's, it's an amazing feat that he accomplished. Um, the other thing, too, is that he uh, was very conscious of weight. And he knew that the more weight he had in an airplane, the more, or the less likely he would be able to make it across the Atlantic. So, for instance, he didn't bring a co-pilot with him. He didn't bring a radio. He didn't bring a parachute. Things that people think might be necessities, he decided not to bring along because of the weight issue. Um, some of the things that he did bring, he brought a rubber raft. Ah. He brought four red flares. He brought an air cushion seat five cans of army rations, rope, needle, fishing line, two hooks, a hacksaw blade, matches, a four-quart canteen of water, a hunting knife, and a flashlight. Wow. And I know we have a picture of the original seat in the spirit of St. Louis. It's a wicker seat. Here we go. That, that seat was there it made, is. Yep, it was made with wicker because it was not as heavy of a material. And that's what we have inside of this cockpit uh, replica. So. Wow. That's great. We do have a phone number for you to dial in if you want to ask some questions. It's area code 320-616-5421. You can see it on the screen right now. Or you can email charles.potler at mnhs.org. 
And uh, Gabriel, before we go, I do have a question from a person from uh, Dania at Lindbergh Elementary, a fourth grader. What did Lindbergh bring with him on his flight? I think you mentioned that, but the food that he brought on his flight, he only brought five cans of K rations? Yep, he brought five cans of rations. He also brought five ham sandwiches that someone had picked up for him the night before the flight, and he actually didn't eat any of them until he saw Ireland. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. Very weight conscious. Well, as Charlie mentioned earlier, you're talking about almost 7,000 pounds flying across the ocean exactly. with 2,900 pounds of fuel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. We're going to turn our attention back to Charlie again. Charlie, uh, back to you. This is great, actually. Thanks for the <laughs> calls, too. Thanks, Dania, from Lindbergh Elementary. Uh, can you tell us about the flight itself? I'm sure people are wondering how it all worked, what he had to do to get ready for it besides mentally, physically, and some other little tidbits you might have. We've given you the buildup so far. <laughs> now for the main movie. Um, this flight was, of course, uh, very uh, the, the biggest flight up to that time. In 1927, this was the biggest flight. So I think right now we're going to switch to a photo of Lindbergh suiting up in his flight gear. And this photo was taken the morning of May 20th, 1927, at Roosevelt Field. Let me give you a little bit of background before he got in the cockpit. I want you to know he had been awake for 23 hours before that. And a lot of people, when they visit the historic site here and they find out well, why, you know, 23 hours, why would a man climb into the cockpit and start a flight that would last at least that long, if not longer? But he, he had an adrenaline rush. He was excited. He was a bundle of nerves, as you could imagine. This is a big feat that he was trying to pull off. And also, this was a contest, remember, and a lot of different pilots were waiting to go from that same field on the same day. And they were all staying in a hotel rooms around him, and because there was a large storm front that was blowing through New York at the time, out to the Atlantic, they thought they were landlocked for at least three to four days. So they were having a good time. They were playing cards, and you got a card over there. They were playing cards, they were drinking, they were carousing. Not Lindbergh. He was trying to get some sleep, uh, but he just couldn't because they were so loud. So that's why he had been up for so long. So once he finally uh, gets up in the morning, he calls the weather service, the National Weather Service, and they tell him, you've got a one-hour break coming in the weather. It's just a little window of opportunity. We wouldn't advise that you do that, but there it is. So he said, you know, we know Lindbergh by now. He's uh, fairly a uh, courageous person, so he jumps in that window of opportunity. That's when he goes out to Roosevelt Field. The plane has been prepared for him. Uh, all the gas tanks have been finally filled for the first time ever, so he's never flown the plane with that much weight before. So this is a new experience for him. So he takes off in his plane, uh, and the runway was mud. It was not a modern runway like you see even at the Little Falls Airport today. He takes off, it goes up in the air, comes back down. It's so heavy, takes off a second time, comes back down, plop. Takes off a third time, finally gets airbound, and, um, it, but the plane is so heavy and he's steering it awkwardly that he barely clears the phone lines at the end of Roosevelt Field by 20 feet. So he just barely makes it. The flight is almost over before it even begins. <laughs> so, but he's, once he's up in the air, then he, he establishes his routine. And because he's an experienced airmail pilot, he knows all about routine and what you need to do every few minutes and every few hours. And uh, so the, the plane is fully loaded. He makes his way from New York up through Massachusetts. Then he goes, uh, he leaves the United States. He goes over to Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. To go from New York to Paris, it's not just a straight line. You go with the Earth's curvature and you, and you go with the wind. So it's kind of a, a large arc that you're making. So Nova Scotia, of course, is northeast of us. That's the last land that he's going to be seeing until uh, Ireland. So it's a long time. And by now, night is falling. The storms are brewing up again. So he's got a long flight ahead of him. Now that brings us to, oh, um, I also wanted to mention, he's starting to get cramps as well. His legs are cramping up. His arms are cramping up. His chest, his neck, everything. But because of his experience, he falls back on that. And he realizes that these things are going to go away. They eventually do. And I think now we're going to show you a photo of the Spirit of St. Louis over water. There it is. And oh. there it is. Uh, that was actually taken during one of his test flights, but that's very typical. He's flying very low in that photograph. But during the, the main part of the trip, once he leaves Nova Scotia, he ascends to about uh, 10,500 feet. 
So that brings us up to about hour 14. He's battling sleep. He, he, that is going to be his main enemy during the entire flight. Um, he see, leaves the windows off that Gabriel told us about earlier, those celluloid windows. Mm -hmm. Keep that cockpit nice and toasty. He doesn't want to keep it nice and toasty because <laughs> that will make him go to sleep. So he uses every safeguard he can think of. He takes the windows off so he has the breeze hitting him in the face. The plane, because of the way the gas tanks are placed, it's not well balanced. This is intentional. So he has to grab that stick and rudder, mm -hmm. and he wants the plane to be hard to fly so that he can fly it for the long duration. Wow. So uh, hour 14, he runs into some ice. This is a major problem when you're in an airplane, whether it's back in 1927 or in 2005. It can be fatal if you get too much ice on your wings and it can weigh down the plane and you can crash. So he realizes he needs to do something. He slowly descends to about 1,500 feet where he encounters warmer air and air where there is no clouds. Mm -hmm. Because he's flying through clouds pretty much the whole first half of his journey. So he takes care of the ice problem. It starts to come off the plane. Then, the next hour later, he hits an electrical storm, a major electrical storm, one that he has never encountered before. And he had often heard tales of pilots running into these kinds of electrical storms and the storms playing havoc with their compasses. Because hmm. the compass is magnetic. Even the electric one, it was messing with it, so he could not tell which way north was. So he had to fly around that storm to try and get back on course so he could get his compasses to start functioning correctly again. So it's a good thing he had that extra 400 miles worth of fuel with him. He flies around the storm. He thinks he's headed in the right direction. Uh, who knows, really? But he, he's, he's a darn good pilot because of his experience, and he's flying by his instruments, so he has a pretty good chance. Let's fast forward a few more hours to hour 20. That's where the sun starts to come up again. By now, it's May 21st, 1927. He's encouraged because at least he's not flying in the dark mm -hmm. anymore. He's still battling sleep. So now he's flying at 1,500 feet, fairly low. And uh, so by hour 27, another several hours forward, he finally sees seagulls. Now, Dave, what do seagulls mean? Well, it means there's got to be either water or land nearby <laughs> or right. a food source. That's right. That's right. So he's very encouraged. He sits bolt upright in his chair. He is wide awake by now. Mm -hmm. The adrenaline's rushing, as you can imagine. So he sees a fishing boat out in the water. He flies the Spirit of St. Louis around this fishing boat. And he says, which way is Ireland? Which <laughs> way is Ireland? And of course, the guy can't hear him because of the roar of the engine. But Lindbergh's excited. He thinks he knows where he's going. So he heads on over to the Irish coast. It's interesting. When he gets to the Irish coast, he finds the landmarks that he's looking for. He realizes that he's only three miles off course. And better yet, he is two and a half hours ahead of schedule. So. He's an expert pilot. His experience is really paying off. So he gets to Ireland. Um, and by now, the entire world is watching him because they know that he's made it across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, he goes through England, over England, across the English Channel, and then finally to the shores of France. He knows he's on the home stretch now. By now, it is nightfall. And so he's, he's flown in the air. This is going on 33 and a half hours that he's been in this cockpit. Plus, he's been awake for 23 hours previous to that. He hasn't eaten. No, he has. Now, when he finally reaches Ireland, he takes out that first sandwich <laughs> and eats it and takes a drink from his canteen. So uh, he arrives in Paris. He finds the Eiffel Tower, which is well-lighted. And he's looking for Le Bourget Field. Of course, we have a park in Little Falls named Le Bourget. But he's looking for it and looking for it. He knows exactly where it needs to be, but he can't find it. The reason is the lights are obliterated by all the sea of human beings down there that are waiting for him. He eventually feels safe enough to land, so he lands the plane. And what's interesting is the people just rush on the plane immediately because he's a world hero by now. They pull him out of the cockpit, and he's traveling on a sea of hands. Everybody <laughs> have marching. Have That's right. <laughs> he's the modern rock star now. So he's, uh, he's on top of everybody's arms. And a quick-thinking Frenchman, I believe from the French military, he pulls Lindbergh's flight cap off of him, puts it on another guy. The crowd surges towards the guy with the flight cap. <laughs> so they rescue Lindbergh, uh, take him into the, one of the hangars. Uh, the Spirit of St. Louis sustains a little bit of damage, mm -hmm. but not too bad. They're able to fix it up the next couple days. But that's when Lindbergh's life changed. 
his original intention was to fly to Paris, see the sights, see some World War I memorials, take a leisurely trip around the countryside, fly over to England, see some of that, because he's never been overseas. Mm -hmm. Well, you think he could get around? He, he had to, you know, he was making speeches. He was uh, the special guest of every ambassador. Of course, America wanted him to come back because he was the American hero. So his life really changed, and celebrity was something that he dealt with with a moderate degree of success and failures during his lifetime. It was, his life was never the same. So 33 and a half hours, he went from a very obscure pilot from Minnesota to a world-recognized hero, uh, a hero that really the world hasn't seen since. That's right, and I think that uh, his legacy, of course, is that flight, but he also did a lot of other things for humanity in yes. his later years, too. So we recognize him as quite a humanitarian, and something that he's done for everybody was a lot, a lot of courses across, uh, flight across the sea. He was actually a very good man from what I've heard. And uh, the people that are listening to us actually have some great questions. I've got to ask these for you. We'll try and <laughs> Well, this is a good one. This is from Lisa from Limburg Elementary, a fourth grader. How did he use the bathroom in the plane? You know, I wish I had a dollar to the site <laughs> fund for the budget every time we got that question. <laughs> we would be doing really well. That's a very good question, Lisa. Lisa. Right. Um, the way that he did it was he had a jar, and uh, he, he used the jar, and he would just throw it out the window. So, sorry about the graphic <laughs> detail of the <laughs> answer, but, but that's how he did it. So, right. and, you know, interestingly enough, that, that same question was posed to him by, help me out, Gabriel, was it the, the King of England? Or the, the, Prince, the Prince of Wales. Of Wales yes. He asked him his first words to Lindbergh were, how did you pee? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, everybody's interested in the human condition. Well, you have you know? to do it. I've got another question. This is from Ben at Lindbergh Elementary, a or Lincoln Elementary, a third grader. What was the highest altitude the plane could go? You said it was at 10,500. Mm -hmm. How high was it designed to go if it could go all the way up? I'm not sure about the answer to that, but I, I think Lindbergh flew it fairly near its, its upper reaches, its upper capabilities, but I'm sure it could go higher than 10,500. Wow. It never flew above that. I do know that. Wow. If any other questions, 616-5421 is the phone number. You can also email Charlie at the email address that's on the screen right now as we see it. This has been very interesting. I think the Limburg Inter Interpreter Center is a place that everybody should come to at least once in their lives because it is a wonderful, wonderful place that houses a lot of Limburg memorials and trivia. And we're right next door to the Limburg House, too. So if people come to Little Falls, they can visit both of them at the same time. We get visitors from really all over the world. And the state of Minnesota is very lucky in that it has a historical society that is so far-reaching and puts money into its resources. The legislature has been very good to us. And um, we have an outstanding facility here. If, like you said, if you haven't been here recently, you should come because this visitor center was totally remodeled in 2002 with brand new exhibits showing Lindbergh's entire life. So we're very lucky and fortunate to have this resource right here in Morrison County in Little Falls. Well, Charlie is definitely well-versed in the life of Charles Lindbergh. Anything else you want to mention about Lindbergh? I know people are curious. This was a very brief discourse on how his flight went. Yeah. 33 and a half hours in the air. Just the physical, uh, his stature, he was over six feet tall. So he was, three. You know, he was a big man flying yeah. in a plane that's designed as well, a kind of a can opener. I can tell you a little bit about what happened to the plane after the famous flight. I'd love to hear that. We've got some time. Uh, you know, we think of the spirit of St. Louis as being this iconic airplane, which it is. Well, of course, the Smithsonian Institution was very interested in this plane immediately after Lindbergh and the plane became famous. Lindbergh wrote a book called We after, after the flight. And the book was basically a recounting of the historic flight. And it was, it was primarily about him and the plane. So uh, he did make a goodwill tour in 1928, 1927 and 1928 to promote aviation because aviation was still in its infancy. A lot of people had never flown on a commercial airplane. Most people had not. It was mainly airmail pilots, crop dusters, um, war pilots, that kind of thing. So he really went on this barnstorming uh, PR tour, so to speak. He barnstormed the country telling people about how safe aviation is and how uh, they should fly planes uh, to get from destination to destination. So he did this in the spirit of St. Louis. He did this goodwill tour. That brings us to 1929. Incidentally, he came to Little Falls mm -hmm. in late August, early September of 1927. Wherever Charles Lindbergh went, he had a huge reception, had a huge parade, 
He usually gave a speech, and he was usually given the key to the city and different souvenirs that have ended up in different museums, of which we have several. Um, but the, the plane actually came to Little Falls in late August, and a lot of people, older people that come to the museum, they'll say, hey, I remember when Lindbergh came to town, and I got to ride in the spirit of St. Louis. Like, you got to ride in the spirit of, that just doesn't compute because we have a <laughs> mock-up cockpit and we know that you can't fit two people in there. <laughs> what we found out this summer through uh, photographic evidence is there was another plane that came to Little Falls that day that was very similar in design, but that took people up for rides. Ah. So, Spirit of St. Louis ends up in Washington, D.C. in 1929. Uh, it has not been taken out of storage and, and owned really since 1929. So it has been, it really hasn't been restored. They just keep it in really nice condition and it's hung up fairly high for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. I've seen it, it is a, it's beautiful. When yeah. you look at the size of the plane, it is not that big. Right. And to think what it did, just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Got some great questions from uh, Lindbergh Elementary again, or Lincoln Elementary this time. This is from an email. Uh, how old was Lindbergh when he, when he passed away? Lindbergh was 72 years old. He lived a full life, uh, but he came down he was diagnosed with cancer in 1973, and he actually came here. This was his last public, um, his last uh, appearance in public was the dedication of the Lindbergh Historic Site right here in Little Falls. That was the last public speech that he ever gave. So that was in late 73, September, and by the next uh, year he, was, he had passed away from cancer. He is buried out in Maui, mm -hmm. Hawaii, and uh, he and Ann Morrow Lindbergh, who is almost equally as famous as Charles Lambert. That could be another program maybe that we do <laughs> in the future great. on Ann Morrow. Um, they were uh, married soon after, a couple years after the flight. But anyway, they had purchased property out on this island, and it's a very beautiful place. Uh, my staff here is trying to get me to fund a research trip out to Maui uh, for their, <laughs> for their uh, education. But I, I, bet I, don't, you are. I don't know if we're going <laughs> to work that out, unless the site manager gets to go with them. <laughs> but that's where he is, in fact, buried. I've got another question, a very good question. Did Charles Lindbergh go to school in Little Falls? Yes, he did, I know that. Yeah. He was not a very good student. <laughs> he wasn't, uh, which goes to prove that, you know, it, his intelligence really didn't have anything to do with his, his grades. Um, during the time that Charles was in high school here in Little Falls, and back then it wasn't, no schools were named Lindbergh. Mm, right. <laughs> so, um, but he went to high school and World War I was going on at that time. That was the first world war in, in which our country was in had participated in. So the farm kids in school, they were exempt from graduation. If they worked on their farm and they produced food for the war effort, then they were given a certificate at the end of the term. So that's the way he graduated from high school. Right. And he did try college, but that wasn't too successful. He did. Uh, he and his mother both traveled to Wisconsin, to Madison, where he enrolled in the University of Wisconsin. And um, he excelled at certain subjects, but he didn't excel at many others that were required, so he was put on probation and eventually uh, he, he left before he was asked, asked to leave. But uh, then he went directly from Madison to flight school out in Nebraska. That's interesting. It's great. It's just great to hear that uh, it's not what you have in school sometimes. It's something that you have in your heart and that you right. the person that you need to be. He had a determination and a drive, and that was never extinguished until the day he died. Incredible. A couple other questions for you from uh, Carrie at Lincoln. Did he get sick while he was on his flight? You mentioned fatigue more mm -hmm. than anything, but he never got physically ill. On he flight. didn't get physically ill, no. He had enough flying hours. He had flown 2,000 hours before this trip, so that's a lot of hours in the air. So he was accustomed to flying in all weather conditions, in electrical storms, in weather, um, rain, high winds, uh, and he had to bail out several times in previous flights, not this one, but when he was an airmail pilot, he bailed out twice. Uh, when he was down in Texas, he wrecked a couple army planes. Uh, so he, he had a lot of experience with uh, jostling around in a small cramped compartment. But the only thing, the only physical ailment he really had were his muscles cramping up. But that dissipated after a couple hours. Well, that's interesting. A couple of other questions. Great questions. Mm -hmm. This is from Mrs. Rush's fourth graders at Lindbergh. Uh, we talked about the plane and the wingspan. It was 46 feet again, you said? 46 feet, 46 from tip to tip. He didn't eat much on the plane, like uh, Charlie mentioned, just one sandwich when he got into Paris. How long did he stay in Paris when he got there, actually? It was uh, at least a couple days? It was at least a couple days, yeah. I'm not sure on the actual duration, but it was several days. Okay. He had to have a suit made for him because 
when he was planning this flight, he didn't plan on making any public appearances and being a hero when he got there. So he had to borrow a suit, I believe, from the American ambassador. <laughs> and in the, the photos you see of him, his first public appearance is shoot suit <laughs> a little short because, you know, he's a tall, lanky guy. Yeah, he's very tall. So he had a Paris tailor make him his first suit, which actually fit him, so he could make these public appearances. <laughs> kind of interesting. And he said during the flight, or before the flight, he said, if I don't need, if I don't make it to Paris, I'm not going to need all this stuff. <laughs> That's true. If I do make it to Paris, I'm not going to need all this stuff. <laughs> That's right. So. <laughs> That's a good question. Did he fly back to America? That's okay. a great question. Great question. And well, basically, um, the American government, the American president, uh, did not want to take another chance on losing him now that he was this iconic hero. So the, a ship came to pick him up mm -hmm. from England. He flew over to England. What they did, they, the ship picked him up, they took the wings off the Spirit of St. Louis, and they made a special large crate uh, to house the Spirit of St. Louis for its trip back to the United States. He comes into New York Harbor in um, mid-June of 1927, and they had a ticker tape parade. We have footage in our exhibits on that parade, you and it's just it. unbelievable it's wonderful. the amount of ticker tape. And ticker tape is basically little pieces of paper that people throw from high-rise buildings down during the parade, and it's just, it looks like it's snowing, mm -hmm. like a blizzard. But interestingly enough, the crate that the Spirit of St. Louis was housed in is now a museum it's a museum about the Spirit of St. Louis crate. You can go into it. I believe it's in, is it in New York or someplace back east, Maine? And you can actually see the crate that the Spirit of St. Louis traveled in on its way back to the United States. Oh, that would be great. Uh, how much of the plane weighed? We talked about that, about 7,000 pounds fully loaded. Uh, was he in contact with people in case his plane went down? Well, of course, he did have no contact. He had no contact because a radio that he would have used would be too heavy. So he left a radio out of the, the plan. And a radio was never retrofitted or anything into the Spirit of St. Louis. One of the neat things you have here, I know, is uh, what would you take along on the flight? You can weigh things out here. Mm -hmm. really, yeah, really nice. So kids, come on and try that. See what you take along on your 33 and a half hour flight. Uh, here's one more question from Mrs. Wallen's class at Lincoln. Where did he live most of his life after he left Little Falls? Very good question. Yep, they, um, you would think he, well, he traveled all over. He came back to Little Falls periodically during his life uh, to make public appearances, uh, but mainly just to check on his boyhood home. Um, the boyhood home was actually given to the state of Minnesota in 1931. So he and his mother and father did not live here after he became famous. So he lived mainly in the eastern United States at his wife's family place, which was in Darien, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So mainly back east. Of course, the history of Lindbergh is very complex, and his first child was kidnapped. And after that unfortunate incident, um, there were other threats made on other members of his family. So they moved from the United States to an island uh, off the Brittany coast. So they lived there for about five years, and then they came back to the United States. I wouldn't call him a recluse in later life, but he didn't do a lot of uh, traveling back to Little Falls, except, as you mentioned, back in 73. Did he come back here other times besides that time? He did, that's a great question. He came back many times incognito. He didn't want to be recognized. He very much shunned the celebrity that his fame, you know, the, the famous flight and the kidnapping and World War II brought him. Um, so he would often go places and not, you know, he would look up friends, but they generally didn't tell the press either. They were very loyal friends. And occasionally I'll run into people that knew Lindbergh here in Little Falls or in Morrison County and they'll tell me interesting little side stories about him that makes him that make him very human, but all of them never really they, they stuck with their friend and they were very loyal to him. But um, what was the question? <laughs> well, he came back here several times. Yeah, incognito. He was, he was very instrumental in helping the historical society, and Russell Fridley was our director back in the late '60s when they were restoring the house and bringing the plans into fruition of building a visitor center that could house exhibits that talked about the Lindbergh family. Mm -hmm. So he was instrumental. He came back about four times, incognito, of course, except for the last time when he made the dedication, the speech dedication of the visitor center. He came back and uh, helped society staff with telling them where certain things went in the house, how the house looked, the paint scheme, you know, what walls were what color. Um, he gave his VW Beetle, which he traveled in, to the Historical Society. And he was a very practical guy. 
And this story will help you envision how practical Charles Lindbergh was. When he gave his VW Beetle bug to the society, he told the director um, back then, he said, you know, you can use it for errands if you need to run into town, or you could haul things with it. You know, I don't use it for what you want. Of course, we wanted to put it in the museum <laughs> so people could see it. But he wanted us to use it as a pickup truck, basically. So. He's a great man. There's one attachment that we have, too, that maybe people aren't aware of. Uh, Lindbergh Elementary School has a great connection to Charles Lindbergh mm -hmm. because Charles Lindbergh did some humanitarian work in Kilgoris, Kenya. And Lindbergh Elementary School has a sister school in Kenya. So you Lindbergh students, ask your principal about that and see what the connection is to Lindbergh in Kilgoris, Kenya, because he did a lot of things later in life to make humanity a, a lot better, too. Another thing, too, Charlie, we are talking about some of the other things he did with uh, aviation. Can you tell us some of the things that he was a pioneer for as far as uh, great circle routes, making sure flights took a lot less time than they did, mm -hmm. Pan Am, things like that? Yeah. He was very involved with the early aviation industry. And part of this Goodwill tour in 1927 and 28 is where he promoted uh, aviation for travel, which was a new thought back then. So he was involved um, in developing specific aircraft, um, aircraft that you could fly and land on water. He wasn't the person who invented that, but he he pioneered it and made it safe uh, for pilots to use. Um, during World War II, of course, there was a little bit of controversy about Lindbergh getting into World War II, but once he was there, he flew in the Pacific Theater, and uh, he showed the, the fighter pilots how to save fuel, and they could get an additional 500 miles out of their planes because they were working with Lindbergh, and he taught them about wind current and how to fly more effectively. You had a great question here. Um, in reading one of the books, I think it is We, mm -hmm. he had some entertainment during the flight, allegedly. How did he entertain himself during the flight? Is it true about the fly that he was keeping track of? There was a little story that I'd always heard that yeah. he had, had a fly that was keeping him company. We get that question a lot, <laughs> and that's mainly from the Jimmy Stewart movie, yeah. uh, The Spirit of St. Louis, which incidentally, I'm not knocking the movie, it's a great movie for entertainment value, but not everything is completely accurate. They took a little historical license mm -hmm. to make the story a little more interesting. Um, and incidentally, Jim, Jimmy Stewart was 50 years old. He was portraying a 25-year-old, but he, he pulled it off. He, he did, did okay. Um, there was no fly in the spirit of St. Louis cockpit, but halfway, and we were debating whether to include this in the presentation today, <laughs> he did, he was so tired that he started having these, um, these mental visions come to him of people uh, that occupied the cockpit with him, and they, they told him how to fly, and they told him what course to take, and they gave him worldly advice. And he talks about this later on in his life, but he figured if he talked about it the first 40 or so years after the flight, then people would think he's a little wacky. Little yeah. wacky. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's probably because of his mental fatigue that, you know, you start seeing illusions, exactly. and, and that's what it was. So. There's some great questions. That's a wonderful question. Another great question uh, from Michelle in Mr. Martin's class at Lincoln. How much did the fuel cost back then? Michelle, I don't know that. That's a great question. You it wasn't stumped. 235 a gallon, I know that. You have stumped the Minnesota Historical Society. Well, this is number we're trying to look up now. Yes, I, exactly. That's and we'll probably add question. that to our exhibit. Do you know, Gabriel? Very good question. Thanks for all the questions. We still have some time left. Remember, the number is 616-5421. You can email us here. Uh, the email list is coming up right on the screen right there, right there. Charles.Potler at MNHS.org. Very good question. I do know gasoline was not $2.55 a gallon. So even jet fuel wasn't. <laughs> they right. didn't have right. jet fuel back then. And the, the octane for gasoline for aircraft engines was a lot higher than, it was about 100 octane. Another so question. Really pure up. fuel. This is from uh, a Tyler and Miss Sims class. Did he have a pet before the flight? Oh, that's a great question. That's a, yeah. Very good question. Charles Lindbergh, when he was growing up here in Little Falls on the farm, he had a, a series of dogs. Um, Dingo was one of the dog's names. Wagoosh was another one. Um, I'm looking to my trusty yeah. assistant here. <laughs> he had five or six dogs over time, uh, and he was very pet friendly. He, of course, Charles Lindbergh, he grew up loving nature, and he was outside all the time, and even his bedroom was out on a porch on the back of the house. He had a pet squirrel uh, named Shorttail that he trained, and actually it was one of the dogs that, that took the squirrel's tail off is how he got his nickname. But we have a photograph in our exhibit of Charles Lindbergh with Shorttail on his hand, uh, wow. you know, playing with a nut. 
Well, of course, Moo Pond is famous at the Lindbergh House, too. Right, and he, he built that concrete pond out of, uh, well, uh, concrete, and it was designed so the ice wouldn't break and wouldn't crack the sides. So it's still here today. And incidentally, when uh, Lindbergh became famous, I don't know if you know about the history of the house, but people descended on Little Falls and descended on the farm place, and they really tore up the house and wrote their names on it, and they, his automobile was here, and they took pieces of that. So, well, we have more questions. We do a lot. Yes. A lot, yeah. We've got about eight minutes okay. left, so we've got some time yeah. for questions. This is great. And these are excellent questions. These are wonderful. Yeah. Um, oh, this is great. This is from Trace. I don't know if it's Lincoln or Lindbergh. How did he buy the plane parts? Of course, he was sponsored by the Ryan Aircraft Company. But if anything went wrong, what would you do? You mean during the flight? I would say probably during the flight. During the flight, he relied mainly on his experience. And they, they checked the engine and checked the plane several times at Roosevelt Field before uh, he took off. And I know that, he, of course, he had to fly from San Diego, where the plane was built, to St. Louis. He visited with his friends there. Uh, and then he went back up to New York. So he worked out a lot of the bugs in the system, the mechanical things that were going to fail. He worked those problems out before the big flight because he had to travel that great distance. Right, and that was not fully loaded either. He didn't have 3,000 right. pounds of fuel. Correct. Time either. Correct. So, but if he was in the air and a, a major mechanical problem happened, then that would have been terrible because he probably wouldn't have made it. This leads up to the next question. This is from Mrs. Rush's class again at um, Lincoln. How many people uh, who tried before him? to make that flight die doing it? Well, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I know, actually, my Gabrielle so tells me six. Six, so okay. I trust her completely. Uh, six people, and right before his flight, uh, there were two Frenchmen that took off from Paris, and they were lost over the Atlantic, and actually, when he left, uh, they were still kind of waiting to hear on those two. So um, they were, they had not heard yet whether they were alive or dead. This was great. Uh, great other questions. Um, how many planes did he fly? We talked about the Jenny. He's doing a lot of uh, male piloting across the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, how many children did he have? He had, well, it's, it's a bit complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had uh, six children uh, with Ann Marl Lindbergh. And uh, then recently uh, we found out that he actually fathered some children over in Germany as well, sure. uh, several years later, towards the end of his life. One of the famous people we have in common is Reeve, his daughter, who stops by, by quite often. A wonderful Absolutely. lady, a wonderful poet, and I wish I could read the book, my favorite book, A View from the Sky, A yeah. View from the Air. It's a wonderful book by her. And she was here this summer. She was here in August, and she visited with our staff. And she appreciates the, you know, the fact that we have a museum here, and we tell the general public about his, her father. It's wonderful. Uh, I have a question, a great question from Tyler uh, from third grade. I think it's Lincoln. How big was the engine? I'm assuming horsepower. How big was the engine and horsepower? Do you know? Tyler? I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> <gonna> <laughs> We've got Stump Charlie here. Actually, today. no, I do know. Uh, it was uh, 24 and a half horsepower. Wow. Yeah. That's not a lot of horsepower <laughs> when you think about it. Well, it, what kind of horses are they? Are they little ponies or are they Belgians? There you, know? you go. I don't know. There uh, you but, go. But yeah, that was a pretty good size engine. That's a great question. Uh, anything else people want to ask? We've got about seven minutes left to go here in this program. The number again on your screen, I'm going to see it again. Thanks to Jerry. There it is, 616-5421, area code 320. This is for October 19th only. That's today. This will be rebroadcast, of course. We want to thank you again for joining us. This has been just fascinating to learn about Charles Lindbergh oh, from an expert. Well, it is wonderful, wonderful. We're glad to have you. Anything else you want to mention about Lindbergh as you can think about it as we're waiting for another phone call because I heard one come in just a second ago. Well, we uh, encourage people to come to the, the site here. Uh, we welcome field trips and the general public. Uh, there's a lot here to see. Uh, this past year, we've been doing a lot of special events on the weekends that we have not done before. And uh, we have two events coming up uh, pretty soon. It's our holiday open house, the last Saturday in November and the first Saturday in December. And we'll actually have Charles Lindbergh's mother, Evangeline, portrayed. So Wonderful. We'll have a Christmas tree in the the living room and show visitors what Christmas looked like around 1917. That is wonderful. Uh, will Lindbergh Drive be fixed by then? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't question. mean to throw that in there. <laughs> Another question from uh, Blake in Mrs. Sims' class. How did they take off the wings when they brought the plane back? Very good question. I, I don't know exactly, but there were bolts that, that held it in place, a uh, mechanism to hold it in place. So 
it was made so that the wings could be taken off because they knew that they would probably have to move it from place to place. Right, it's tough to have those things when they're perpendicular to the plane. Can't exactly. Them off. Exactly. I have a question for you. I don't know if you know the answer to this one. Lindbergh was the first to fly from New York to Paris. Who was the first to fly back from Paris to New York? I'm not sure. That's a good question. Look that up on the internet, kids, because I'd like to know because I don't remember who yeah. exactly that was. You've given me a lot of good information to look up. Yeah, so. See, that's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to keep Charlie on his toes. <laughs> you got another question coming up here. Thank you. Uh, let's see. This is from Hale in Sims class. This is Sims class. Oh, how long did it take to build the plane? Very good. It's when the Orion Aircraft Corporation got it. Yeah. How long? It did not take terribly long. Uh, basically, there, was, there were two phases, the actual building phase, which was the second phase, and the designing phase. The z designing phase took about three weeks to do, which was very fast. Um, today, when we hire, uh, when we have a big building expansion or something like that, it takes a long time to design it and the actual construction. But the uh, airplane manufacturing phase took about two months to complete. So, wow. and we have a lot of photographic evidence the people at Ryan, the employees there, they knew that they were doing something historical. They didn't know how historical, but they knew that this was a major plane that they were building. So there, was, there were a lot of photographs taken during that process. So uh, we have a lot of good evidence left. Um, but it, overall, it took almost three months. Wow. You've got to come out here to see this, because all the things that Charlie's talking about are here at the Interpretive Center. A couple more questions coming up here. Excuse me while I amble off camera. Uh, let's see. Oh, the cost to build a plane said about ten thousand five hundred dollars. Yes, that right? yes. Okay. And kind of a footnote to that question is the Charles Lindbergh, Charles and Ann Morrow Lindbergh Foundation, which is an environmental organization, each year, and they're located just in Anoka. And we have a good relationship with them. They give out grants each year in the amount of ten thousand five hundred dollars mm -hmm. in honor of the original cost of the Spirit of St. Louis. And we have a lot of those people come up to Lindbergh School for yep. the presentation. Today. Wonderful. Yep. Another question so coming up more. here. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for the questions, everybody. Here I go. The magic of cinema here. Uh, this is from Aline. <laughs> did Charles meet Amelia Earhart? Yes, Wonderful he did. Wonderful question. Yes, he did. And uh, they were contemporaries. She was a little bit younger than, or yeah, younger than Charles Lindbergh, but they did have meetings. Uh, they did know each other. They were friends. They weren't terribly close, but they knew of each other very well. And he gave her some tips, but she was a very capable pilot and very talented in her own right. So right. she broke a lot of records herself. And a nice mystery finding out whatever happened to Amelia. Right, one Maybe that we happen. might not ever know. That's exactly right. Another question coming up? Another? Okay, great. <laughs> We've got one more minute left, and then I'm going to bring Gabriel back on camera to say thanks for everybody. This is from Christian. <laughs> what was his favorite food and drink? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Gabriel. I don't know, Christian. I'm sure he had a favorite food and drink, but we do have uh, Evangeline, his mother's cookbook, and we know uh, that, that she used a cookbook and some of the favorite family recipes, but I can't tell you exactly what his was. It's I a know great his question. favorite cookie was a Swedish butter cookie. Oh, yeah. come on camera again. We do want to thank you for joining us on this live broadcast, broadcast, broadcast through Channel 6. Thanks to Jerry and the gang here at Channel 6. If you have any questions, be sure to ask Charlie. Come out to the Interpretive Center. He is here. And when does the Interpretive Center open back up again? We, well, we're open two more weekends in October. And then we open up May 1st for school programs and then Memorial Day weekend for the general public. Okay. Well, and this we're open is, six days a week then. This is wonderful. And this is funded by the state of Minnesota, which is a great, great place to put money. And the exhibits here are absolutely wonderful. You will learn a lot. Gabrielle is the technical manager here. She is the right-hand man standing on the left hand of Charlie right now. And Charlie, thanks a lot. It was wonderful, yeah, and we you. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, and thank Gabrielle. you, Jerry. And thanks, thanks Jerry. a lot, everybody. And this will be rebroadcast. And thanks for all your questions. And this is Dave Gertz saying goodbye from the Lindbergh Center.